afternoon. Welcome to another exciting edition of Reading with Mr. Ebley. Still reading Grenade. Uh, so we read in chapter or pages uh, 114 to 124. And so this ch chapter is about Hideki and it's called Yoke. Maybe that's how you say it. Hideki's foot stuck in the mud. He tugged and tugged until on it until his foot came right out of his boot. It took him ages to dig his boot out in the darkness. When he could finally walk again, Hideki staggered to the top of a hill and stopped for a minute, bone weary. He had to travel by night. That was the only time the American battleship stopped shelling the island. Hideki made sure he was still pointed toward the dark silhouette of Shuri Castle in the distance. If Shuri Castle was still standing, the Americans couldn't be winning too much. Hideki felt a swell of pride at that. As long as Shuri Castle still stood, so too did Okinawa. Hideki took another step forward and his feet went out from under him. He fell on his back, and suddenly he was tumbling and sliding down a steep, muddy slope. He crashed into the shattered remains of tree stumps, but bounced off them, was lashed by saplings, but couldn't grab them. There's nothing he could do to stop his long, dizzying barrel roll, <laughs> long, dizzying barrel roll down the hill till he plunged headfirst into a pool of mud. Hideki's skin crawled. With a horrified yelp, he realized he was covered in maggots. Probably not a good part of the story to read while lunch is going on. They were in his hair and inside his shirt and down in his pants. Hideki screamed and scrambled away, tearing at his clothes. He stripped off his shirt and his shoes and his pants and both socks, even the shorts he wore as underpants. Hideki ran his shaking hands over every inch of his body, now glad for the pounding, incessant rain that washed him clean. His skin still crawled, crawled, and his shuddering turned into a constant tremble in the cold rain. Hideki wrapped his arms around himself and shivered, but he would not put his clothes back on, not with them covered in maggots. Hideki had never felt so naked before, so utterly helpless and exposed. Everything he was, the person he had been, all of it had been stripped away. He was nothing, nobody. He was a ghost. Hideki's ceramic grenades glistened in the mud. Miraculously, they hadn't cracked in the fall. Hideki remembered Lieutenant Colonel Sano's words to him and all the other boys. One grade is for the American monsters coming to kill your family. You are to use the other grade grenade to kill yourself. Hideki hadn't used either of his grenades. He'd been too frightened to throw one at the Americans. Might be too frightened to ever throw one at the Americans. Did that mean he should use one on himself here and now, the way Lieutenant Colonel Sano had told him? Hideki wanted to. No, that wasn't true. He didn't want to be here now. He didn't want to be naked and shivering and afraid, but he didn't want to die. And if he used his grenade on himself, he could never fulfill his promise to his father to find his sister. Still shiver shivering, Hideki picked up the sack with the photos of His Majesty the Emperor. Some pictures had fallen out and he had no hope of finding them, but he saved what he could. The sack and his two grenades were all he took with him. Hideki trudged on until he heard voices in the darkness, foreign voices, Americans. Will they even see me? Hideki wondered. Am I really a ghost? But no, he must be alive. Not even death could be this cold. Hideki gave the American camp a wide berth, his eyes searching the darkness for anything that might give him shelter or warmth. There, a blacker spot in the darkness. Is that the opening of a cave? So close to the American camp, Hideki staggered over to it. You okay? Someone whispered at him out of the darkness. Hideki froze. You okay was the Japanese word for a spirit, a ghost. I'm... I'm not a yokai, Hideki said, his teeth chattering. I'm... What is the password? The voice said. Hideki suddenly understood. The man was a Japanese soldier, and yokai was the challenge word of the day. Hideki wanted to come through. He had to know the response. Utah? Hideki guessed. Suddenly, a Japanese guard stuck a rifle in his face. Hideki had guessed wrong. The soldier snatched Hideki's grenades and led him into the cave at gunpoint. A covered light helped Hideki's eyes adjust, and he saw the floor of the main cavern was filled with wounded Japanese soldiers. More IJA soldiers with rifles squatted here and there, and at the back of the cave, huddled together, were ten Okinawans, mostly women and children. Who's this? an IJA lieutenant demanded. An Okinawan boy. I caught him outside, said Hideki's captor. He didn't know the password. He had these grenades on him. I think he's a spy. I'm not a spy, Hideki cried. My name is Hideki Kinoshiro. I'm a member of the Blood and Iron Student Corps, and look, he opened the sack of photos he carried. I've been protecting images of His Majesty the Emperor. The lieutenant nodded his approval. All right, get a new uniform over there. The corner the lieutenant pointed to was stacked with the bodies of dead Japanese soldiers. He meant for a decade to take the clothes off a dead man. Hedeke did as he was told. He found a jacket and pants that fit him if he rolled up the cuffs. The pants had bullet holes in them, but at least they were warm. 
He found a helmet too, but none of the dead soldiers had shoes small enough for Hideki's feet. He went barefoot instead. Water, bring us water, one of the injured soldiers moaned. Another grabbed at Hideki's trouser legs. Get over here, the lieutenant barked at Hideki. We're planning an attack. An attack on who, the Americans? That was crazy. There are only seven healthy soldiers, including the lieutenant. The wounded men need water, Hideki told the lieutenant. Don't waste your time on them, the lieutenant said. They'll be dead soon anyway. Time has come for a counterattack. This is an American camp nearby. We will leave the camp, leave the cave, and surprise them just before dawn. Hideki couldn't believe what he was hearing. But the Americans have lots more men than we do, he told the officers. They'll kill us all. The lieutenant ignored him. Issue grenades to the wounded soldiers who can't march and tell them to kill themselves when we're gone. They're not to be captured by the enemy. Any soldier who can walk comes with us on the attack. That's still not enough, Hideki argued. Be quiet, the lieutenant cried. He struck Hideki across the face with the back of his hand, sending Hideki to the floor. Junior officers will speak only when spoken to. The lieutenants turned to one of his men. Get the Okinawans, he said. We'll strap explosives to them and send them out ahead of us. Hideki watched, aghast, as two of the soldiers dragged an Okinawan woman and her baby out of the corner. The woman was wearing a beautiful blue bashofu kimono with white flowers on it. How she had managed to keep it clean so long all, all, while the battle was ranging all around them, Hideki had no idea. Hideki blinked. Suddenly, he saw the woman as though she and her kimono had been tinted by a photographer. The only spot of color painted on a black and white photograph of the war. And then the soldiers tied a belt of dynamite around her waist. Hideki lurched forward, trying to stop them. No, you can't. They're not soldiers. The lieutenant shoved Hideki back and pulled out his pistol. You will fight. You will all fight. This is your island, after all, the lieutenant spat. Hideki was still reeling as the lieutenant slapped the ceramic grenades back into Hideki's hands. You should all be the ones dying to defend it, not us. This was crazy. Hideki slipped the grenades into his jacket pockets and staggered back, looking for some place to run, some place to hide. But there was no other exit from the cave. The lieutenant put his, pointed his pistol at them all, Okinawans and Japanese alike. Now attack, the lieutenant screamed. For Japan, for the emperor, attack. This chapter is called About Ray, and it's called Kakuzu Ridge. All right, boys, let's show them what the Marines can do, Big John yelled. Attack. Ray took a deep breath and climbed over the ledge of the foxhole. Stay low, don't bunch up, and run like hell, he reminded himself. The running like hell was the easy part. Ray was so scared, he ran like a locomotive was bearing down on him. Big John did the same on one side of him, Gonzalez on the other. The hill above them was called Kakuzu Ridge. For more than a month, the army had tried to take this one little hill from the Japanese, and every single time, the Japanese had beaten them back. Now it was the Marines' turn. Ray, Big John, and Gonzalez stayed five paces apart and ran low as bullets began to whip into the mud at their feet. A mortar blew up to the left of Ray, and just like that, Gonzalez was gone. Ray couldn't stop. He couldn't think about it. He kept running uphill, his heart thumping so hard he thought it would burst. He slipped and slid as he turned to get traction up the slope, hauling himself up on shredded tree stumps and saplings when he could. Bullets zipped, grenades boomed, and then suddenly Ray was at the top of the ridge, what they called the saddle, the gap in the ridge where two hills came together. Ray could see a small valley just beyond Kakuzo, and another tall mountain range on the other side. The valley might once have been green and lush, but the naval bombardment had left its stumpy, blackened wasteland filled with giant craters. It was like looking down on the moon. Ray didn't have much more time to take in the scenery. He dropped flat and dragged Zimmer down beside him. Somehow, the rookie had survived the charge. Big John had, too. He flopped down next to Ray in the saddle, his blue tracer fire from a Japanese machine gun skimmed the air right above them. A fourth Marine, a recruit so new, Ray didn't even know his name, collapsed on the other side of Big John. Am I dead? Zimmer asked. Am I a ghost? You're not dead, Ray said. Not yet. But what do we do now, Sergeant? Nobody else had made the saddle with them. Big John didn't seem to hear him, and that's when Ray noticed he wasn't wearing his helmet anymore. He didn't have a right ear anymore either. Big John, your ear, Ray yelled. It was a bloody mess, but Big John didn't seem to notice until Ray pointed to it. Ray dug in his web pack for bandages and wrapped Big John's head for him. Huh, Big John said, peering over the side of the ridge while Ray worked on him. I think I can see my house from here. I can't see a blessed thing, Zimmer said. He had his face in the mud and his arms around his head. They're mercifully safe here in the gap between the ridges, but the rest of the battalion was taking heavy fire trying to get all the way up to the tops of Kakuzu and Kakuzu West. What do we do? Ray asked again, this time yelling loud enough that Big John could hear him. Big John lay on his back, hugging his big, 
bar like a security blanket. I figure if we lay low here long enough, some of those Japs from the south slope are going to get it in their heads they can counterattack. That means they gotta come right through us. Turn around and get yourselves in position. Ray was already in position, but aiming at any attacking soldiers meant raising his head, and it sounded like the bullets were missing him by inches. It took him every ounce of courage he had just to shift his face to the side, and he held his breath as he twisted his chin forward. Come on, Ray, he told himself. You're not going to die with your eyes closed. Ray let out his breath and opened his eyes. It wasn't much of a view, just more mud and coral and the little lip at the edge of the saddle that had kept them all from dying for the past five minutes. Beyond that, through the haze of smoke from mortar and artillery fire, Ray could see a sliver of the Green Mountains beyond. That was where the Japanese soldiers would come from if they came at all. No sooner had Ray thought about it than the mortars and grenades stopped falling. He tightened his grip on his rifle. The IJA wasn't shooting anymore. That it could only mean one thing. The Japanese were about to storm Kakuza Ridge themselves. So we will stop there. Again, if you missed any of these, we'll post them up on our YouTube channel as well. I'll keep on reading uh, every day at noon, so we'll keep on going tomorrow. Uh, so students keep working hard. We've got two more days today and tomorrow uh, left in the school year. So uh, have a great rest of the day. Uh, take care of each other. And most importantly, stay safe. And remember, range is away.